Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for tuning in. This webinar series has been developed this year in order to provide audiences of this website with a big picture vision, first-hand observation, and timely updates of the global textile and apparel industry from leading experts in this field. Today's webinar is titled, The Possible Actions on Trade Before and During a Biden Administration and the Potential Impact on the Textile and Apparel Industry. We have privilege to have Nicole Bevins Collinson as our speaker. She's the president of the International Trade and Government Relations at the Sandler Travis and Rosenberg at the Washington, D.C. office. She has over 30 years direct experience working with companies to help them benefit from the rules and regulations into the United States and globally. As a quick reminder, her presentation was recorded on late December 2020 after the election, in which Nicole has shed some light on what will continue and what could change and the potential direction in trade policy of Biden administration. After Nicole's presentation, there will be a Q&A session hosted by Justin Huang, the president of Taiwan Textile Federation. He will have a discussion with Nicole on some of the issues that our audiences are keen to know. Now, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Nicole. Enjoy the presentation. Hi, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be able to speak with the Taiwan Textile Federation again. I think it's been almost four years from the date when we last spoke. I came to Taiwan right as the 2016 elections were taking place, and President Trump was announced as having won those elections. So I appreciate this opportunity, and I want to get started. We're going to take a look at um, some of the changes that might be happening as a result of the election what could happen between now and the end of the election, and what might happen under a Biden administration. So I'd like to share with you this presentation. And we'll go through each of these uh, different policies, looking at what could happen, as I said, between now and the end of the Trump administration, and what could happen under a new Biden administration, and what is the potential impact particularly on the textile and apparel industry. So let's get started. First, just a reminder that any information that I present in this webinar is not considered legal advice. If you are interested in getting legal advice, please consult us directly so we can speak with you about your specific area. So first, will the US trade policy change? I think we've got to think about what is could happen between now and the end of the year, what can happen before the uh, transition into a new Biden administration, if Congress has the ability to act, or would they act before we have a transition? What is some of the legacy items that are going to be in place from the current President Trump administration that the Biden administration will have to inherit, and how will they deal with that? And then we also want to take a look at what are some of the issues, the key positions that the President-elect Biden will be putting in place and how will those positions potentially impact the United States policy vis-a-vis -vis China and vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, more importantly. First, let's take a look at the Trump administration and what he may do between now and January the 20th, 2021. First, we already know that China is a big focus of this administration from a trade perspective. We have the Section 301 tariffs that are in place, and it's very possible that before the president leaves office, he could make some additional changes. As you know, right now, all the items that are on lists one, list two, and list three are at 25% tariffs. But items that are on list 4A are only 7.5%. In addition, there is another list, 4B, which has not experienced any tariffs yet. It's very possible that between now and January 20th, that the president will increase the tariffs on the items for list 4A and potentially put tariffs in place for items on list 4B. It's a very real possibility. The other is there is a, the Department of Commerce Bureau of Industry and Security, the BIS, maintains an entity list. This is a list that names people, entities, individuals, institutions, 
corporations that with which US companies are banned or prohibited from interacting unless they have export licenses, unless they have specific licenses to do so. And it covers, the license will cover just about every product. So it doesn't matter if you're making, you know, dual use technology, or if you're making, um, you know, uh, writing utensils, if you're writing a pen using pens or pencils, if you're exporting those, you'll still have to get an export license. It just depends on what kind of license you'll have to get. And as you may have noticed just recently, the United States listed over 77 entities from China and Hong Kong on that list. It makes it very difficult to do business. The Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control or OFAC has been putting more and more entities on their list. It's called the Specially Designated Nationals List or the SDN list. That list means not that you are banned from exporting anything to that entity, but that you are banned from conducting any type of action or transaction that results in a financial benefit or gain to the entity on the list. This makes it very, very difficult um, for companies who are conducting business because the Treasury Department considers that if there is a transaction that takes place in US dollars, that that is one that will impact that benefit or give some sort of benefit to one of those entities on the SDN list. So a lot of companies have been very careful trying to look through their supply chains, having to go back to the tier three, tier four suppliers to identify who they are and what they are and what their relationship is in particular for our example in China, if they have any relation to the XPCC or the Xinhuan Production and Construction Corporation. So that has been very difficult for many US companies. The International Trade Administration at the Department of Commerce has self-initiated many anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases. We've just seen a couple of those announced in the last two months. We may see more of those launched before the president leaves office because once it is launched, it is on a path that must proceed forward. There's no stopping that action. Same thing with respect to the International Trade Administration self-initiating anti-circumvention anti cases. We've seen several of those conducted recently, and we've seen instances where goods that were made in Vietnam were deemed to have just been circumventing the Chinese um, countervailing and anti-dumping duty tariffs, and so tariffs were then put in place on Vietnam. Taiwan one runs that risk because many times production might shift to Taiwan from China if there's anti-dumping or countervailing duty, so you have to be careful about those cases and what they're doing and which countries they're looking at as a result. The, the Department of Treasury's CBP, or the Customs and Border Protection, they have been issuing withhold release orders. Now, this is something that stops your goods at the border. The most recent use of the withhold release orders has been if there are allegations of forced labor, forced child labor, indentured labor, or prison labor. This has been a key focus. It's not just because of the Trump administration, but Congress passed a law or amended an, an existing law that made it more obvious of customs responsibility to stop goods at the border if there is a belief that they are being made with forced or child labor or prison labor. So that policy has been put in place since 2016 and we've seen a huge uptick in the number of these withhold release orders. And most recently they put a withhold release order on any cotton that is made by the XPCC, a subordinate or an affiliated company. What that means is more opportunity potentially for Taiwanese exporters to be able to take some of that uh, production and to, and to provide U.S. companies with a clear line of sight into the supply chain all the way back to the, the cotton fiber. And if you're able to do so, you can take advantage of the situation. There's also the CBP is using the EAPA investigations. This is the Enforce and Protect Act. Again, this is something that Congress mandated in 2016, so it's not necessarily the Trump administration, but it is because of the confluence of the Trump administration coming to, to the, the office and the change in the legislation that allows CBP to look at entries. I mentioned before that the, the Department of Commerce can do an anti-circumvention uh, investigation. That's really the same thing that CBP can do under the APA, except that they can do it on a specific entry on a, from a specific company, whereas Commerce Department generally does it on a, 
on the entire commodities from certain countries. So CBP can do it on a company by company, shipment by shipment basis and the ITA does it more on a countrywide basis. But both of them have been doing that. We've seen 131 of the IAPA investigations by CBP, and they're continuing that strongly. Again, that's something for Taiwanese traders to be aware that this, is, this can happen when the goods arrive at the border. There's no advance notice, just like the withhold release orders. There's no advance notice. It happens at the border. The other is that the CBP has been um, potentially looking at removing an exemption that puts in place, that is in place right now, that if you import one shipment on one day for one person, you don't have to make a formal entry. You don't have to pay duties. That means that it's called the de minimis or the section 321 provision. That limit is $800. So I can import from Amazon or from Alibaba or from anyone a shipment of, of my Christmas shopping, let's say. If it's under $800, when it comes into the United States, I pay no tariffs. I don't pay any of the anti-dumping. I don't pay countervailing. I don't pay Section 301. And so that right now, Customs is trying to change it so that you would have to pay the anti-dumping or countervailing. You would have to pay the Section 301 tariffs. That's really going to impact e-commerce. That could also happen before the end of the Trump administration. Some other issues, as you know, other than just sort of the 301, is that we have um, Section uh, 301 investigations on France for their digital services tariffs. And if you may recall, this is uh, some countries are putting taxes on entities that conduct business in their country um, electronically. So this would impact eBay, it would impact Amazon, it would impact other large US companies in particular an investigation was conducted. It was found that yes, this harms US companies and we have tariffs waiting to be applied on January the 6th, 2021 against France. We also have pending investigation on several countries. As I list there, the EU, Indonesia, Australia, Austria, I'm sorry, Brazil, Austria, Czech Republic, India, Italy, Spain, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. All of those are being conducted for the same issue on the digital services tax. There's also two investigations pending right now in Vietnam. One is for allegations of using illegally harvested timber and producing different wood items. And the other is that they are undervaluing their currency. What's important to note is that the Treasury Department is normally the one who makes a determination on currency and whether or not there's any type of manipulation. And interestingly enough, last week, um, the Treasury Department released its report, which was due in October, so it was very late, and it named Vietnam and Switzerland, in fact, as currency manipulators. That doesn't set a good precedence for what might happen for Vietnam, and again, what that means is potentially an opportunity, and one country's misfortune can be another country's opportunity, so Taiwan traders might be able to use that if there were some goods that moved from China to Vietnam for manufacture. Now, potentially, you could move those into Vietnam, I'm sorry, into Taiwan um, as an alternative location. The other is on Section 232, there are two, uh, there's still the steel and aluminum uh, uh, case that's out there where the tariffs are in place, but there's also a review under the electrical steel cores. I believe that that is going to be determined and that there will be tariffs put in place on those products. So we're going to watch that very closely. Again, that might be something that if Taiwan is producing these products, you need to be aware that your products could become subject to tariffs potentially before January the 20th, 2021. On China tariffs themselves, I mentioned that we have them on all of these items. And what's important to note is that though there have been exclusions that were put in place. So individuals were able to petition the government and get their product excluded from those tariffs. Those, are, those exclusions, with the exception of about eight items, are going to disappear on December the 31st. So we're looking at all items being subject to these tariffs. Again, the, the misfortunes of the Chinese produced goods can become the fortune and opportunity of those same goods if they are made in Taiwan. I think what's going to be important is that companies that may have been resistant to moving production or shifting the origin from China to Taiwan might be more willing to do so given the fact that these tariffs have been in place so long and that they're, they're still there. It is important to note, however, that there is legislation that is pending 
And there are many companies, uh, there's probably over 3,000 companies that have filed a lawsuit against the Trump administration in the Court of International Trade, challenging the legitimacy of the tariffs on list three and list four. That's pending, that might come about though next year. So we'll have to see what happens there. Now, what about Congress? So right now we are in the 116th Congress. They're looking very closely at a forced labor bill focused on the Uyghur population in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, the XUAR of China. That bill was passed overwhelmingly bipartisan in the House. It's pending right now before the Senate. It's very possible that this bill is not going to move. Um, the Congress right now is in session as I speak. By the time we view this, they will have finished their session. I'm not as optimistic as I was that this bill is going to move forward, but I believe that if the bill sponsors were to bring it forward for a voice vote, that it would pass. So it's very possible. Again, this misfortune um, is could potentially yield additional business for Taiwanese traders, so it's something to watch out for. The other pending bills that are at the um, Congress, which might move before the end of the year, are the miscellaneous tariff bill, which suspends or reduces tariffs on certain products, the generalized system of preferences, which expires at the end of this year. I know Taiwan doesn't benefit from it, but the other company, other countries do benefit from it. And so they're going to lose this, this benefit at the end of the year, unless there's some legislation extending it. There've been different bills introduced to extend it for six months, to extend it for 16 months. I'm not sure if they're gonna get it, any of those extensions. So that may be allowed to lapse. There's also a pending bill that would remove the tariffs, the section 301 tariffs on personal protective equipment. That bill could move forward. And then um, there's also the, uh, a bill to try to withdraw the um, permanent MFN status to China. I, that's out there. There is a lot of uh, anger. It, depending, again, if the most recent, recent breaches in our security system are pinpointed on China, Congress could react a certain way. So we have to wait and see what they might do by the end of the year. Now let's move on. The future. Let's talk about what might happen under a Biden administration. First off, the China tariffs are not going to go away immediately. I don't see any way at all. And the Biden administration is basic, or the, the speakers for the incoming Biden administration have basically said that tariffs are good as long as they're used strategically. And they're going to take a look at what's going on. Now, what they might do is they could extend the exclusion process, allowing companies to repetition, or they could extend exclusions already granted to help provide some relief to, to traders. They could also allow the court challenge. I mentioned before that there is a pending lawsuit against the, um, the administration. And the difference is that we might have seen a Trump administration fight that lawsuit really, really hard. And then if they lost, appeal it to the court of uh, appeals, it's very possible that under a Biden administration, they don't fight as hard and they don't appeal it to the court uh, of uh, federal circuit, the court of appeals. There's also a review that's underway by the Congress looking at some of the COVID items, for example, and whether or not the tariff should be removed from that. And then the other is that under the statute, every four years, the if you have applied the Section 301 tariffs, you have to undergo a thorough review. In addition, every 180 days, the items that are subject to those tariffs are supposed to be reviewed. So we could see the Biden administration come in and conduct an initial review of the items that are on the list, and then allow in four years, that's not going to be until 2022, however, but in, uh, in 2022, start looking at potentially removing those tariffs. Again, between now and this time, or that time whenever the tariffs are removed, it is an opportunity for Taiwanese traders. With respect to Vietnam, as I mentioned before, it's very possible that the Trump administration will put tariffs in place on Vietnamese exports. It's gonna be really difficult, I think, for the Biden administration to remove those tariffs. So I think it's we're gonna to have to wait and see until the Biden administration conducts its first review of currency manipulators, which would be due in April of 2021, before we determine whether or not they remove Vietnam from the list of manipulators or if there's other actions. So that might happen maybe in the second quarter of 2021 that the Biden administration might seek to remove any tariffs that were put in place by the Trump administration. 
We also have already heard um, very clearly that the Biden administration plans to take a much more uh, multilateral approach to addressing the, the concerns with China. We've seen clearly that just by putting tariffs in place, it didn't change our trade deficit with them, and it has not changed China's behavior. So in order to try to effectuate change, which is what my understanding is that the goal is, um, the Biden administration plans to reinsert itself into the global leadership and try to get other countries' allies on board. Now, this might be something that Taiwan is looking at in the future, but of course, understanding that you also have to deal with China, you have to weigh what is going on in China with what might be going on in the United States. I don't think that there's going to be a phase two agreement with China. I don't think that the Biden administration is going to use the same mini deal philosophy or these small trade packages as the Trump administration did with China, as they did with Japan. Um, so I don't think we're going to see that uh, same type of strategy going forward. With respect to the 232 tariffs, I believe that actually the Biden administration is going to use the potential for removing those tariffs as leverage to get other countries on board and in line with them on some of their policy, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, I also think that if that the electrical steel core uh, 232 investigation has not been put in place, I don't think we're gonna see a Biden administration put any tariffs on those products coming into the United States. The other government agencies under a Biden administration, they're unlikely to change. That's the BIS, the OFAC, and CBP, the Bureau of Industry and Security, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, and the Customs and Border Protection. Because as I mentioned, they are taking actions pursuant to law. So it's not just pursuant to the Trump administration, but for laws that Congress passed so they're doing what they are supposed to do. I don't see that changing. I see a continuation of entities being placed on the BIS list. I see a continuation of the specially designated nationals list run by OFAC being increased. And I see additional withhold release orders or EAPA investigations, anti-circumvention investigations being launched by the CBP. I think we're gonna see that um, continue. Uh, and I think that the Biden administration might use those government agencies because uh, as, as a tool to try to effectuate this and or continue this strong policy, because it's not then the president taking action, it's these agencies following law. So I think we might see that a continuation. Um, we're probably going to see the Department of Labor continue and regularize their TVPRA report, which is the Trafficking and Victims and Protection Reauthorization Act. That's a law that requires that every year that the Department of Labor review commodities and countries as to whether or not they're using child labor or forced labor or forced child labor. Under the Trump administration, we didn't see a report until the final year of the administration. Under the Obama administration, we saw a report every single year. I think under a Biden administration, we're gonna see a report every year. The key thing on that is if your country is named and if an industry in your country is named, you kind of get on a heightened awareness list from a US sourcing perspective, from US companies looking to source, if they want that product and it's your country is named as potentially having problems there, you're going to ne probably move to a the back of the line as, as a potential sourcing su uh, supplier. The other is the Department of State has a trafficking in persons report or the TIP report. And that report also we think is going to continue to be reviewed and issued regularly under the Biden administration, which it was not under the Trump administration. With respect to free trade agreements, what might we see? Because there's been some that have been started under the Trump administration. I think we're gonna see the EU moving together, uh, moving forward, but I am, I'm not optimistic that we're going to see any type of a free trade agreement, at least in the first 18 months of the Biden administration. Their focus is going to be on US economy, US jobs, and the coronavirus. So those three things are going to occupy a lot of time they, they will spend time unwinding some of the Trump trade issues, but I don't think they're going to go into a lot of the uh, trade issues as quickly as some might think. Under the EU agreement, we might try to resolve the steel 232 tariffs or the Boeing Airbus tariffs or the DST tariffs. 
and use those, as I mentioned before, as leverage to get the European Union on board with respect to how they might be interacting or treating China. With respect to the UK, I think that we will see an agreement with them. I think it might happen in the first year. The problem is I don't think it will be resolved before March or April, and that's really the time frame that they would need to do it if it is to be considered under the existing Trade Promotion Authority, or TPA, which expires in July. So we've got to, there's a, there's a time frame for considering these FTAs that the administration must be aware in order to get it through Congress under a straight up or down vote. If they don't meet that timeline, then Congress would have the ability to amend the agreement. I just don't see an agreement coming together in the first three or four months of the of a Biden administration, of any administration. I think the same is true with respect to Kenya. I think that the Biden administration might take a little bit of a different approach to um, a deal with Kenya, and it may be more asymmetrical. Um, and I, that's what the Kenyans want. And I think that they're willing to, to wait their turn and they're not in a rush. With respect to Brazil and India, I don't, again, I don't see anything moving forward with respect to those countries in any type of a mini trade deal or a free trade deal in the first 18 months of the Biden administration. With respect to TPP, there is a lot of talk about rejoining the TPP. I think, however, it could convert more into a process of seeing if TPP countries want to dock onto or join the USMCA as opposed to taking some of the USMCA provisions and trying to change the TPP, which would be a huge undertaking. I think the US might reach out to TPP partners and see if they want to join the USMCA and expand that. So we'll wait and see. Now, with respect to Taiwan, I think one of the greatest chances that Taiwan had of potentially getting a free trade agreement was under a Trump administration. I don't think that the Biden administration is going to be willing to push that button as hard as the Trump administration was willing to do. So we never know. We could see Trump back in running as president again in 2024. And if that is the case, there might be another golden opportunity, I think, um, for Taiwan to look at that. But again, recognizing the relationship with China globally, we'll have to wait and see if that might be something that moves forward. And I know that there's pressure in Congress to try to do so, and we'll have to wait and see. Um, with respect to whether or not the Biden administration has trade promotion authority, which is the authority from Congress to allow them to negotiate, as I mentioned, that expires. I don't see the Biden administration actively lobbying Congress to renew that um, authority, again, because I don't see that free trade agreements are going to be their priority in the first 18 months. However, I think if Congress decides to extend the TPA, the Biden administration will support it and they will get behind moving it forward. Now, looking at some of the appointments, these are the positions that I think Taiwan needs to be most aware, and that is some of the nominations we have already for USTR Catherine Tai. Catherine Tai is um, a young professional. She's currently the Democratic Trade Council on the Ways and Means Committee and on the Trade Subcommittee. I've known Catherine for many years. She has a great, she's one of the most qualified USTRs of anyone they, we, they were considering. She has worked for private sectors, so she understands international business. She worked at the USTR and the General Counsel's Office, so she understands how that agency works. She understands how free, to tra free trade agreements work. She's been at the um, on the Ways and Means Committee in the House of Representatives. So she understands how the legislative branch works and their role in trade agreements or trade policy. So she brings all of those together. Plus she lived in China and she speaks Chinese. So she has a great understanding. China is a priority um, and they are a concern. So I think that we're going to see her as a key appointment. Many people have asked, what, what does she think about China? What does she think about trade? Because of all of her positions, positions, we have not seen her individual uh, thought process or her individual position on trade issues, what she might think of Taiwan, because she's always worked for other people and helped carry out their policy. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what she does, but I do believe, um, again, she's going to be following the policies of her boss, uh, which will be President-elect Biden. So I don't think, again, that we're going to see a lot of her personality. What we might see her personality emerge is how the talks are conducted or how policy is moved forward. With respect to commerce, we don't have a, a, a single nominee yet. I honestly don't think Terry McAuliffe is going to stay in there. 
he is in Virginia and has just announced that he's going to run for the governor of Virginia. So that might block his willingness to serve in the Commerce Department. Um, the Meg Whitman is a former governor. So it'll be interesting to see if one of these people get into it. Um, I'm not sure. The Secretary of State is Tony Blinken. He's a longtime uh, Obama, Biden ally. He's uh, a very known entity. He's very steady. I think he will bring a level of cooperation. Um, I don't think it'll be very innovative in how his approach. I think we might see it very similar to what we saw under an Obama administration. Under the Homeland Security, this is an issue, Alejandro Mayorkas. I think that that, uh, of course, besides being important because of his nationality or ethnicity, um, the appointment, I think it's going to be interesting to see what role he's going to take. I don't think it's going to be quite as aggressive as we've seen the past Homeland Security um, secretaries, or I don't think it's going to be quite as uh, instrumental in forming trade policy. Treasury Department, Janet Yellen, she's a very well-known figure in what she's done and how she's done it. She, um, as you know, was the um, Fed chair. So I think she's gonna take a very conservative approach. And I think that it's going, to be, um, it's going to be interesting to see how she deals, particularly with the huge deficit that we're in as a result of the additional funding for coronavirus, et cetera. The White House Chief of Staff is another very well-known uh, person, Ron Klain. He's been around during the Obama administration and will, uh, He's very trusted, he's very close, he's very loyal to um, uh, President-elect Biden. So I think we're gonna see um, a very steady hand, a very knowledgeable hand. We'll see, see a restoration of normal order. Um, I think we won't see nearly the uh, entertainment that we've seen under the Trump administration coming out of that White House, under a Biden White House. So it'll be, it'll be interesting again to see how the normalization process takes place and whether or not um, there's a, a, the same level of information that comes out of the White House that we saw coming out of a Trump White House. With respect to defense, General Lloyd Austin, again, just uh, because there is growing concern in the United States about China's assertion in the South China Seas, um, it'll be very interesting to see who takes this position. The problem with the current general that's been nominated is that he's only four years out from retirement of having served in the military. Normally, our, our, our law says that you have to be retired at least seven years. And part of that is to create this um, uh, separation between a former general leading their troops directly and to taking this type of leadership position. There was an exception that was made most recently from Mattis. Many members of Congress have said that they will not do it again. So it remains to be seen whether or not he will be able to take this position just due to our laws and whether or not Congress is willing to make an exception to that law. Now, what about Congress? I think that the Trade Promotion Authority, we are going to see an extension. I think that there may be a lot of additional restrictions or um, guardrails, if you will, put around the president um, as a result of the president's Trump administration ne negotiating these little mini deals with other countries. I think we're going to see some changes in the TPA with respect to 232. Again, I think that there may be uh, legislation passed that tries to make it so that if a president decides to take action under 232, that that action must either be approved prior to the president taking action or if the president takes action, that Congress still has the ability to negate or reverse the president's action. With respect to Section 301, I think we're going to see authority restored to the uh, Congress. They're going to shift the uh, exclusion process over to the ITC, and we may see some other changes about if there are small suppliers. We could see um, some changes or guardrails put in place for the International Emergency Economic Powers Act because there are none right now. Um, the president can do whatever the president wants to do under this, so there might be some changes there. If GSP or MTB are not extended in the 116th Congress, we will see it, I think, extended under the 117th Congress. Just as a reminder, for some very useful websites, we have a resource page. This is something that I create, keep up to date, you'll get the most recent information on any type of tariff actions. I highly recommend it to you. And then we have a newsletter, 100% free. Sign up for our newsletter and you can keep up with all of these issues as well. So before we take questions, 
now that I've laid out what some of these possible scenarios are, how is that really going to impact textile and apparel, and particularly the Taiwanese manufacturers? Let's take a look at the items that are on list 4B and from the China 301 tariffs. As you know, there are a lot of apparel items that are listed on list 4B, and the possibility of there being any action taken between now and when the Trump administration leaves is very high. But I would say that if the Trump administration has not taken any action to impose tariffs on those items on list 4B, I do not anticipate that an incoming Biden administration will take action, particularly in the very early stages, on any items on list 4B. So I think, if anything, we might see the Biden administration undertake an overall review of the actions of the Trump administration on China under Section 301, because the law stipulates that every 180 days that the list of items that are impacted should be reviewed. So it's very possible that the Biden administration will undertake a review in the first 180 days of the administration, looking at all the items. And what might happen is goods will come off of it. You know, there's also a lot of apparel items that are on list 4A, and those could be removed. So we might see that type of a change for textiles and apparel under the Biden administration. With respect to the Vietnam Section 301 investigation, I think it's important to remember that the, because one of the investigations is on currency, that this could impact all products, meaning I don't think they're going to make a distinction between apparel items or any other type of item for a currency, a positive currency determination, uh, manipulation determination. So I think that if we have um, not seen any tariffs been put in place under the Trump administration, it will be under the Biden administration to make a determination. I don't think that they would immediately take action, but rather that they would give themselves 180 days. Again, the language of the legislation will allow them to meet with the partners and try to resolve the issue. So we could see a delay of any type of a tariff being put in place. The other thing is, I think under a Trump administration, we would see a tariff that would probably be in the 10 to 15% range, whereas under a Biden administration, it might be lower. And the reason I say it could be lower is because during the Commerce Department's review of a countervailing duty case against Vietnam, the Treasury Department provided to Commerce what they believed that margin of manipulation was, and the amount was 4.7%. Thus, we could see under a Biden administration more of a tariff if it is applied to be applied later in 2021 and to be applied at a rate of around 4.7%, 5%, where under a Trump administration it could be higher. With respect to um, the uh, products that are being imported from China on, and that come in and are related to Xinjiang, as, you, as I mentioned, there is a, a lot of pressure on China for human rights abuses in the Xinjiang region of the Muslim and the Uyghur people. It has resulted in several actions, which I set out before and said that we may see more of them. So what does that mean, though, for brands and what retailers and how are they reacting? What I can tell you is that every brand and retailer with which I work, and that's many, they're all very concerned about ensuring that their supply chain is clean and is free from forced labor. Generally, brands know their tier one suppliers They've asked questions about forced labor or working conditions, but they've not then pushed back and said, oh, and what about the fabric that you're getting? And what about the yarn that is used to make that fabric? Now they're asking to go even further back to what about the cotton fiber that was used to produce the cotton yarn that was used to make the cotton fabric that was used to make my cotton apparel. So you're seeing many brands and retailers starting to send back deeper level certifications and verifications from their suppliers, asking them to verify that their fabric supplier, the yarn supplier, and the cotton fiber supplier are not related to XPCC cotton. We could see that expanded not just to XPCC cotton, but to all cotton products coming out of Xinjiang. We've already seen the Fair Labor Association has put out a notice to all of its uh, suppliers or any companies that supply to members of the Fair Labor Association, that if it's a product that comes from Xinjiang, 
it's banned, not just if it's really coming from Xinjiang and related to XPCC. So we're seeing a lot of um, brands and retailers looking to their suppliers to give them this chain and visibility into that entire supply chain. For the Taiwanese manufacturers where you're invested, if you're invested in Bangladesh or in, in uh, Vietnam or in Thailand or Central America, if you're able to demonstrate to the brands and the retailers that you have complete line of visibility into the supply chain back to the cotton fiber, you're the ones who's going to be able to go to the front of the line. They're looking for those types of suppliers. So you will want to be able to sell your visibility to the U.S. brands and retailers demonstrating that you have this knowledge and you know how you can help them meet their obligations and ensure that they are not running contrary to U.S. law. Um, Another issue that might be of interest is for those of you who are making or have switched to making PPE products around the globe, um, it, although there was no legislation that was passed which would have granted, um, in some cases, duty-free and in some cases, at least removal from the additional tariffs, whether they were 232 tariffs, 301 tariffs, 201 tariffs, any kinds of additional tariffs on PPE products, that legislation did not get passed in the 116th Congress. But we expect in the 117th Congress that there will be a bill introduced seeking to do just that. And the reason I say that is because in late December, uh, Congress received at, had requested and then received from the International Trade Commission a very in-depth report looking at U.S. manufacturers of COVID-related equipment, including PPE, face masks, gowns, uh, foot coverings, head coverings, et cetera. And they found, and they in this report, stated that in many instances, while there could be production in the United States, that the um, uh, inputs necessary to make the goods many times needed to be imported, and where there was no production in the United States, that the investment necessary to be able to produce the goods did not was so heavy that it would not necessarily yield a return on investment before the need for all the PPE expired. So the Congress is very aware that some finished products will need to be and continue to need to be imported, and they should not have these additional tariffs, as well as that some of the inputs that are needed to make these goods are uh, not going to be made in the U.S. and should be free of the different tariffs. And then finally, on the free trade front, I just want to bring to your attention, I know that there's been some concern about the RCEP and signing of the RCEP and what that means um, for the United States given the TPP or the CPTPP. As you know, the U.S. withdrew from the TPP. It then was signed by the remaining 11 countries and became the CPTPP. And it's possible that there will be an interest um, in many different uh, areas in the United States to join the TPP or CPTPP or something similar as a, as a counterbalance to the RCEP. Um, I've also heard that because many of the provisions that were in the TPP were incorporated into the USMCA, that it's also likely that the Biden administration may take up an approach of looking to expand the USMCA to former TPP countries. Instead of going to the CPTPP and saying, hey, we like that, but we want to change it because we changed it when we did our USMCA, so we want to make those changes now, it's very possible that the United States may take an approach of seeking to expand the USMCA. Now, what that means from an apparel perspective is if you have invested in the, at least the USMCA countries, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, you will have additional markets that you may be able to seek inputs or you may be able to sell the finished goods. Um, and as you know, in the USMCA, the rule of origin for apparel is a uh, yarn forward. So regardless, you would still need to be able to have to um, source your yarns from one of the countries and your fabrics and then make the product in one of the countries in order to qualify. So there's lots of um, potential options and to touch down apparel entry. And with that, I will close and take questions that you may have on how this further could impact your industry. Thank you. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and to deliver the, your remarks concerning this uh, US trade policy after the presidential election, particularly for the textile and clothing supply chain. And I have already perused what you have spoken on this topic. Thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. 
And uh, now is the question and answer session. So the first one is <clears throat> the US market is uh, very important in the global supply chain. President Donald Trump's policy to change the trade issues uh, that caused uh, a lot of uh, problems of the global supply chain to export to the US market. Now, January 20th, we have new president, Joe Biden. And we believe he may have some trade policy amendment on global textile and uh, apparel supply chain to the US market. And uh, it is also the very moment about the COVID-19. So we have read that uh, there's a report said uh, Mr. Xavier Patera, the Attorney General of California is the nominee for the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So what are the measures he may take to contain the COVID-19 and would, would these new measures help improve US economy? We all know that the cold chain in the United States now is getting a problem. Uh, many states cannot be supplied sufficiently about the vaccine. So this, is, this will be a very much influence to the future of this reconstruction of the market, retailing market, as well as the supply chain. So I hope you can give us your comments. Sure. So I think uh, uh, Mr. Becerra, if he is confirmed by the Senate, will focus absolutely on vaccinations first. Uh, that's going to be his number one priority. I believe that he's going to take a different approach to the United States than the Trump administration um, and Secretary, the Secretary Azar, because I believe my understanding is he will meet with all of the governors of the 50 states and working with them will try to, one, organize a rollout of the vaccinations, as well as addressing shutdowns or closures. My understanding is that he wants to work with each locality and let them decide if they should be closed, or if they should be open, um, how they should be closed or open, so that the idea is to get businesses back open, operating, to get children back in schools as quickly as possible. But I think one of the, the key things that we should focus on for most of your members is that the pandemic has changed US consumer habits drastically. The biggest change is to online shopping so that now most of our shopping experiences occur online than do in stores. That is expected to continue. Because of that, there is um, a, a potential possibility for many exporters from around the globe. And that is to potentially locate a distribution center in either Mexico or Canada and use that distribution center to fulfill the e-commerce orders. We also have a law in the United States. It's called our de minimis provision for one person, one shipment, one day. So if I order something online and I, it's coming to me from Taiwan or Mexico or wherever, if it is valued under $800, when it is imported to me, I don't have to pay any duties. I don't have to file a customs entry. I don't have to give my tariff classification. It comes into me duty-free. What that provision does, and because e-commerce has become so important to so many retailers, is that there are retailers locating their distribution centers in Mexico and in Canada, and then they fulfill their e-commerce from there, which means they can bring in the large 53-foot or 40-foot containers from Taiwan, they can bring them into Mexico, and they don't pay duties when they go to Mexico, right? because they're, um, they're going to be exported. Then when they ship them, put them in small packages to ship to my house, they don't pay duties on them. 
This enables companies to basically become duty-free exporters if they're exporting into e-commerce to individuals under $800, a duty-free export. So this is something that we've seen that has really changed the entire uh, shopping experience. All of the retailers that I've spoken with, and I've been doing an investigation on this, and I've spoken with four out of the top 10 US apparel retailers in the United States, and they've all said that they are looking at this as an option. And part of that is because they want to near shore, they want to shrink the global supply chain because of the, the worry about if another pandemic hits and if Taiwan were to shut down, you know, would I have enough goods? If your distribution center is basically coming in from Mexico and you're shipping over there, then you, you don't have to worry. You may be able to ship goods into Mexico and then get them from Mexico into the U.S. Keep the inventory outside the U.S., keep the inventory away, because that's the other thing. Many of the retailers, now they are closing many of their physical locations, right? Mm -hmm. Stores, Macy's are closing, all of the apparel, many apparel uh, companies have gone bankrupt. Um, because of these closures, they no longer want to keep that, that inventory. So that means for apparel manufacturers, if they can supply the e-commerce or if they can ship directly to stores and hold the inventory themselves, that's going to be able to give them advantage, I think, in the post-COVID environment. So I think that for companies looking at what's going to happen and how the new administration might address the pandemic, it's going to be more on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, and I think those, the way to get an advantage is to really look at how you can service the e-commerce needs of the retailers because they're shrinking their stores and they want to be able to get the goods in um, duty-free if they can. As a matter of fact, last year, because of COVID-19, many retailers and brands, they have already uh, decreased their orders or postponed their orders. So that caused uh, big problems in Asia. But however, the inventory of the brands and retailers in last year, they have already sold a lot of products uh, to the, uh, through the, the, uh, the e-commerce. So mm -hmm. this year, at the beginning of this year, I learned from a couple of uh, brands, they have already increased their orders to place the, in Asia. Mm -hmm. 15 to 30% more than the same period of last year. So which means that the inventory of the brands and retailers have already, maybe they have already consumed a lot. So brand right. importers, they are going to uh, fulfill their inventory by placing big orders this year. So that's a good news for the supply chains. This is true. Yes, that's very true. And the second question, very recently brands including like uh, Nike, Levi's, Gap, Target, and North Face urged the Biden government to rejoin the Paris Agreement. It seems that Biden also tends to reverse Trump's decision and step up to rejoin. Will there be more legislation and stricter standards for the future US trade policy on environmental sustainability? That is a great question. And it's actually one that I was responding to earlier, uh, just today to a client who was very interested in what is going to happen. So because of the elections that were just held in the special elections earlier in January on the Senate race, the two uh, senators are Democrat. That means that our Senate is split 50 Republican, 50 Democrat. But because the White House is also Democrat, the vice president breaks any tie. So that means the majority is in the Democratic Party. So you have the House, which also is majority Democrat Party. So you have the House, the Senate, and the White House, which means that if there's legislation passed in the House, which is where most of it will originate on these types of issues, it will probably be passed in the Senate, and then the White House will sign it and implement it. There has already been um, 
Uh, for example, uh, Representative Blumenauer from Oregon, he is the chairman of the trade subcommittee in the Ways and Means Committee. He said um, that he intends to reintroduce a bill that he had introduced, which would impose a carbon tax on imported goods, as well as on US manufactured goods. So it has to be fair for WTO reasons, of course, but that there will be a carbon tax bill, uh, a piece of legislation that will be introduced sometime in, I believe, 2021. So I think we, we need to be prepared for that. There's also um, legislation that had been introduced in the previous session of Congress that focused on in, uh, imposing bans similar to the ban that we have on importing goods for forced labor if the goods were produced or uh, manufactured on land that had been reclaimed due to deforestation. So they're calling this the deforestation bill. And that bill, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of de deforestation in Taiwan, um, but that is another bill that we think could happen uh, with respect to climate issues. And I think probably there is, um, there are a couple of other bills that have been in, put in place that would give tax breaks to companies that undertake certain um, um, efforts to for renewable energy. Uh, it's not clear if that would extend to companies that um, are operating overseas. In other words, your, the a Taiwanese company here in the US, an entity, maybe they could get a tax break if they are using geothermal power uh, of one of their facilities, or if they're using solar energy. It's not clear yet, but they're looking at legislation that might also give corporate tax breaks or benefits for renewable types of energy. For your information, I learned from uh, a number of leading fabric mills, textile mills in Taiwan. Uh, last year, they found they re, they realized that there is a fact: sustainability is the only one issue that will be concerning the whole market in the world. So they are going to invest a lot of resource and capitals to build up a sustainable environment for their productions, not only in Taiwan but also in their overseas manufacturing network. So I hope. Uh, for this investment and uh, in combination with the U.S. new trade policy of environmental sustainability, uh, Taiwanese textile industry would be more or less beneficial uh, in the result. Yes, it's very possible. And the third question, uh, we know that the U.S. brands and retailers are suffering the double blows of COVID-19 and the trade war According to information, tariffs have made American consumers and brands pay more. In order to save the economy and jobs, will Biden administration have different strategies other than trade war to achieve greater economical interests? I think he's going to look at different options, but the administration is not going to reverse everything immediately. With respect to, for example, the tariffs that are in place on China, that's not going to go away immediately. There's several options for when and how that might go away. Um, there's under the statute every six months, the president is supposed to review this measure and determine if there should be some adjustments made. So there might be some adjustments that would remove the tariffs that are currently on some of the apparel items, which you know, for, for your producers in Taiwan, that would be bad because right now you have an advantage. But for your investors in China, that would be good because they would then be back on a level playing field with everyone else. Um, there's also the possibility of a court case that is pending right now in the Court of International Trade. That might be adjudicated by September, August of this year. If the court were to rule that the Trump administration exceeded its statutory authority, then they could demand that all those tariffs that were paid be refunded and the tariffs be removed. So that's a possibility. 
Then there's you know, also the possibility that the um, Biden administration might determine that some of the tariffs need to remain in place. And what would be key is to undertake uh, an education and an advocacy effort uh, with the White House, with the Biden administration, and with members of Congress to get them to push, at least from my position, push on them to ensure that if they want to keep tariffs in place and if they're going to use tariffs, that they should not do it on absolute necessities. Every person needs clothing. Every person needs shoes. Those are absolute necessities. Those items should not be subjected to any additional tariffs, regardless if it's on Vietnam, if it's on Taiwan, if it's on China, whomever it is, making sure that they understand that the necessities should not be subjected to additional tariffs. I also think that this administration is going to look very much towards other allies and try to get them to join in addressing um, trade inequities, uh, and particularly with China. I mean, most of the focus is on China right now. To get them to also look at ways to, um, to get China's attention and prevent them from taking advantage of intellectual property, of trade secrets, abusing the World Trade Organization rules and, and premises uh, as they are just perceived as doing. And so I think that they're going to look more towards their allies. They may come to Taiwan, asking Taiwan to support them in some of these efforts. So, you know, recognizing your very delicate position, it's something that your government will have to consider. You know, what, what actions will you take? Um, but I, I think they're probably going to look, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to look more for global actions. I also think that we will, we will try to undertake reforms at the WTO that will allow us to then bring cases when we have trade disputes to the WTO. And if we reform the appellate process sufficiently, I think that that will be the course that the, the Biden administration will pursue. Well, uh, for this trade policy against the China imports, we learned some information from China our investor, investor over there, they said uh, before at the end of 2018, uh, the VAT refund, refunded rate was around 11.5%. Uh, and uh, by the end of 2019, uh, the refundment rate uh, became to be 16%. And the uh, RMB's uh, currency rate also declined 7% during the year of 2019. Plus the local government, provincial government or city government, they also have a bonus to, to give to the exporters. Once they export uh, in a standard of amount, they will get a bonus. So all of these subsidies that would uh, decrease this 25% import tariff rate. So maybe, mm -hmm in the US uh, Biden's uh, administration in the future, they may take pay more attention about all of these uh, issues uh, rendered by Chinese government. So this exactly. is what I feel, yeah. And the last, yeah. The last was, question, please. I was, I was just going to add, I think that that's one of the issues that the US would use the WTO to get their allies to push back on these types of subsidies, illegal subsidies their manufacturers. Right. Yeah, this is something that uh, there must be somebody to do something. Mm -hmm. oh, the first question is, uh, is there any regulation put in place that some textiles or apparel must be made in the United States or even use fabrics made in the US? Uh, we have some laws. One is called Buy America. Another is called Buy American. And then we have a provision that is known as the Berry Amendment. All of those require that any goods that are produced or procured for federal uh, uh, agencies must be made using U.S. origin almost all the way back to the fiber. The yarns, the fabrics, the cut making and trimming done all in the United States. But that's limited just to federal government procurement. 
there are some provisions that allow, if we have a trade agreement with a country, <coughs> allow us to be able to use inputs from those countries. So we would have to look at what the product is and see if it might be allowable. But just with respect to overall production for any retailer or any person, um, we do not have those in place. Those are only in place if you're trying to take advantage of a preference program or a free trade agreement. So if you are trying to get duty free into the United States, you might want to manufacture under a uh, free trade agreement partner and invest in Mexico. Well, you don't have to use necessarily American or US yarns and fabrics uh, and do the work, but you would have to use Canada, Mexico or the United States. Um, same thing if you're dealing with any of the other free trade partners, it would have to be either US and Australia or US or Singapore, which if you're making apparel in Singapore, it's probably gonna be US yarn, but you're not gonna be making apparel in Singapore. Um, but uh, if, the other is if you're doing a, one of our preference programs, for example, the AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, that is um, the Sub-Saharan African countries can have duty-free access to the US if they meet certain um, criteria. But with, with, for most of those, you don't have to use US fabric. You can use Taiwanese fabric, you can use Taiwanese yarn. Um, so they're, they're really limited just to, um, I think Haiti has some limitations where you can use US, but they also have another program where you could use Taiwanese. So depending on how you manufacture, you may or may not have to use US fabric, but overall, you can use fabric from any source and bring it in. It's just going to be subject to duty. Now, the one thing that I know there has been some, um, some pressure is to, to get Congress to change our laws so that if I were to use a US yarn or a US fabric, that when I would bring in the apparel product, I would not have to pay duty on the value of the US origin yarn or US origin fabric. So I would have, I would still pay duties. I would still pay, you know, 6% on my shirt, but instead of paying 6% on $10, I deduct the value of the US fabric, which is $4, and now I only pay the 6% on $6. So I'm reducing my duty liability. It's not a duty reduction, but that legislation has not been passed. Um, there will be efforts to reintroduce that legislation in the 117th session of Congress. So it's a possibility. Again, it's not mandatory. It would be for a benefit. Um, and it would just depend on your manufacturing scenario if you wanted to use that. Thank you very much for giving us uh, such, uh, such many informations. You can see that uh, it's very complicated to trade with the United States concerning textile and clothing. And uh, we appreciate that you have already uh, shared the information with us. And we also would like to urge our textile and clothing manufacturers in Taiwan to pay more attention about the US trade policy and the relevant uh, uh, legislation's works. Thank you very much, Nico. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, we hope that we can see each other either in US or in Taiwan sometime in the future. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.